We must move on to the questions to the Minister of Education, and I call Mr. Robin Swan. Question number one. On the 13th of March, after careful consideration uh, of all con uh, consultation responses, I announced my final decision on changes to the common funding scheme. I maintained from the outset that this was a genuine consultation. I was delighted with the level of response received and have listened to the views expressed from all who took time to respond. I have amended a number of my initial proposals, taking into account concerns raised, but also ensuring the key principle of targeted increased resources and social deprivation remains. I can confirm that no school will receive less funding this year than it would have done if I had made no changes to the formula or budget. I have therefore made available a transition fund for these schools, whose budgets uh, under the new arrangements is less than they would have received had the budget and formula remained the same as in 2013-14. Schools have received notification of their delegated budget for the incoming financial year. Mr. Swan for a supplement. I thank the Principal Deputy Speaker and I thank the Minister for his answer in recognising that the, co the first common, fund common funding formula did not work and needed changed. But does the rec Minister recognise that the transition fund that is put in place and the short term nature of it is leaving it hard for principals to actually budget into the future, into next year and into the following years as well? It is the nature of the, the budget system. I will not know the, the Education Department's budget for 15 16 until the Executive agrees it. So therefore, I can make no commitment to any sector under the guise of education, whether it be schools or education and library boards, beyond the current financial year. I can ensure the member that I will endeavour to uh, secure uh, whatever funding I can for the provision of education going into the future, and I will take a serious look at a transition fund going into the future for those schools who may have lost funds as a result of the changes I have made. But it's worth noting uh, that, in terms of the amounts schools are losing, the maximum is £11,000, and 86% uh, of the schools that are losing are losing less than £3,000. A pupil at a school carries an average value of around £3,300, somewhere around that. So if a school loses a pupil from one year to the next, then they have to deal with that loss as well. But I, I have made a commitment for this year, and I will endeavour to do everything I can for the years that follow. Sean Rogers. Thanks to the Minister for his answer. Minister, you're right in saying that all schools got their budget. Can you explain that why in some board areas they got a complete breakdown of their budget, but in other board areas they didn't? Um, no, is the answer to that question. I have provided all the information to the boards. I have published information on the Department of Education's website. It's the responsibility of the boards to notify each individual school of their funding allocations, how each board carries that function out will be a matter for each board, but I am of the view that full information from the very start is the best way forward. Call Ms. Maeve McGraw. I uh, thank the Minister for his response, but can I ask the Minister specifically to maybe remind members why reform of the Fountain formula was necessary and, in effect, how it relates to his commitments on the programme for government? I thank the member for her question. Uh, members will recall that I was not satisfied that the existing common funding scheme was fit for purpose, and I did not believe it matched our, our policy requirements or the need to tackle social deprivation and raise educational attainment for all our young people in the schools. I set out with that objective. That objective remains. As I said in response to the original question, I have taken on board consultation responses and concerns raised throughout the consultation response. But the primary objective of directing more funds towards those schools dealing with high levels of social deprivation remains. Uh, those schools have received that money. I have also committed to putting in place tracking to ensure that, that money is spent uh, in the endeavour of reducing educational entertainment for all our young people, and those measures will be announced in due course. So Jim Allister. The Minister says he cannot anticipate next year's budget, but does he accept that the natural outworking of the formula he has adopted will, in the absence of ongoing transitional aid, result in significant loss for many schools into the future? Uh, well, I, I don't accept that there will be significant losses for schools going into the future. Uh, and I remind the member of my answer to uh, the original question. 84% uh, or 322 of the 385 schools 
which are losing money, will receive less than £3,000 in the transitional funds. So they're losing less than £3,000 in this year. 93% of 357 schools will receive less than £5,000 in the transitional year. So there's not a, no school is losing a significant amount of money as a result of the changes I have made. I have committed to ensuring all schools' budgets uh, remain the same if I had not made uh, significant changes to the common funding formula. But the member will well know no minister standing at this dispatch box is able to predict what their budget will be for 1560. Kesht ever though let a hold question number please two please. Uh, self evaluation leading up leading to sustained self improvement is central to my school's improvement policy. Self evaluation should be an integral part of the school development planning process with actions and targets set out in schools. Uh, school development plan. In 2010-12, uh, the Chief Executive reported that many schools are performing well and have a strong focus on improvement. However, I recognise the, the need to ensure that there is a continued focus on actions to promote improvement, which includes school development planning and self-evaluation. To support schools with this, the Department has produced and disseminated guidance on effective school development planning. The Department also provides schools with data to inform self-evaluation and help schools identify areas where improvement is required. In addition, education and library boards provide training to schools and school governors on school development planning and effective use of data. The Education and Training Inspectorate continues to promote a culture of self-evaluation within our schools. It has provided resources for schools called to gather towards improvement. This tool supports self-evaluation of the quality of the educational provision uh, through inspection the ETI assesses the effectiveness of schools self-evaluation processes and identifies good practice or where improvement is required. Together towards improvement gives transparency to the inspection framework and promotes a common language for school evaluation and inspection. Could I thank the Minister for his answer? But can I ask the Minister how self-evaluation is reflected in the school development planning process? Um, self-evaluation is an integral part of the school development planning process with actions and targets set out in the school development plan. There is a statutory requirement for schools to prepare and periodically revise the school development plan and regulations set out the matters to be addressed in the plan. Uh, it is essential that school governors and the principal and the leadership team and all staff demonstrate a commitment to engagement and involvement in the de development uh, planning process. The Board of Governors should monitor and review progress against the plan. And the, Depart the Department, as I have already said, has provided guidance to support schools in the preparation and implementation of school development plans, which assist in school evaluation. Mr. Danny Kinahan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his answers so far and fully appreciate the good guidance that is given on self evaluation. But would the Minister or the Department actually help schools with some form of resources or even finance so they can use third party advice on self evaluation? Well, I hesitate to state that it's not self evaluation if you have to bring in a third party. Um, and though I accept the principle the member is trying to make. Schools, and we're, we're very lucky that the vast, vast majority of, of our school leaders and teachers and principals are dedicated to the profession in which they're involved and see their, their role more vocational than a, a job. And many of our schools have demonstrated how self-evaluation should take place. The ETI um, share best practice when observed with, with other schools, so the ETI also allows uh, for assistance in a third-party role uh, in that regard. And uh, we have issued, my own department has issued information to the schools to allow them to self evaluate. So there is good practice going on throughout the system. And I think it's important that we give credence and respect to our school leaders and boards of governors to allow them to develop their own school development plans as well. I call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. If uh, through school development plans and self evaluation processes, we end up in a position like there is in McCoskin Primary School, just outside Korean, where a very effective and productive principal is finding difficulty with the board in uh, trying to ensure that capital uh, expenditure is spent by the board uh, in developing a nursery school. What can the uh, minister do to assist? 
Uh, I'm reluctant to comment on an individual case of no details about, but I suspect that both are not related. It was a clever way of introducing uh, the member's school uh, in relation to this discussion. But I suspect school evaluation, school development plan, and the provision of a nursery unit are not uh, all connected, nor is the capital connected to that as well. School evaluation should continue regardless of the discussions between a school and the Education Board about future capital uh, developments at the school. Thank you. And I call Mr Dominic Bradley. Question number three, the hall. Question number three please. Uh, John Horkin and Jonathan Hudson conducted the review and presented me with their report at the end of last year. As I made clear in my statement of 11th of March, I am content with the findings of the report and have accepted the recommendations. While challenging to and at times critical of all the parties involved in delivering, overall the report is a fair one. An acceptance of the recommendations will feed constructively into the ongoing policy review. The recommendations include reviewing the technical delivery options, moving the management of CBA to C2K, setting clear timescales for future CBA policy and procurement, and clear articulation of the benefits uh, of the policy. I have tasked my officials to take forward this work. The independent review report is now available on the DE website. I call Mr. Dominic Bradley for a supplement. Camille Mayer got a free last concordia, August Gumbuich, as they a sort of a The OECD report and the independent review mentioned by the Minister both highlight mistrust among the schools and failure by the department and by CCEA to consult meaningfully. Um, will the Minister now? give the House uh, an undertaking that he will listen to the views of teachers and take serious account of them. Uh, and I can assure the Member and the House uh, of that point that I will and have taken uh, into account the views of, of teachers and schools in regards to the computer-based assessment policy. And indeed, as, a, as it was as a result of taking on board those views that I have suspended uh, the statutory implementation of computer-based assessment in schools for the second year running now, and we are running on a pilot basis. Last year, around 185 schools uh, took part in a pilot and was very beneficial uh, to the further development of the technical issues around computer-based assessment, and this year is going to be used to develop the policy position in relation to computer-based assessment. So, Lessons have been learned uh, in regards to computer-based assessment. Uh, the, the hudson harkin report has further interrogated that, and I have asked my officials, in fact, I have instructed my officials to go away and implement the lessons learned from it. Ms. Sandra Overland. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I wonder um, if the Minister could inform the House what will the Minister put in place to ensure schools have the necessary time to properly use computer-based assessments? Well, we had introduced a single computer-based assessment uh, or centrally procured computer-based assessments on the basis that we would save money for our schools and also save time in schools seeking out and procuring uh, individual uh, assessments themselves. A significant number of our schools do use uh, commercially available assessments, and that's referred to in the OECD report, indeed touched on within the, the CBA report as well. Uh, these assessments, while useful, do not meet the needs of our curriculum. Uh, and or while being some, somewhat useful assessment to our schools, I believe that we should further interrogate computer-based assessments centrally procured, delivered by is the question who will deliver it, what will it look like is the question, and how long that procurement will remain in place uh, moving forward. To ensure that we, we minimise uh, any pressures upon our schools, either in the procurement of or the delivery of, of computer-based assessments. Call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Well, Deputy Speaker, I understand the Minister recently said he hoped uh, uptake of this would continue on a voluntary basis. Could the Minister advise the House if uh, any schools have signed up to this? Uh, the, the Member is quite correct. In my 11th of March statement to the House, uh, I said that we would be running a further pilot scheme this year. Um, 185 schools signed up to the pilot scheme last year. SEA will be no announcing early next month. Uh, details of the pilot and asking schools to sign up to the pilot at that stage. 
call Mr. Ian McRae. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Can the Minister outline, and always referred to the recommendations in the report, can he outline a time scale as to when he feels that the um, report can be considered and recommendations will be brought forward so that principals and schools can introduce um, something that is fit for purpose for the 21st century? One of the, the key mistakes that was made during the last procurement exercise and delivery of this project was uh, roost. It was a roost project. Uh, people were uh, head, heading steam, steam like towards a deadline, and at some stage in that roost, a call should have been made to stop and evaluate where things were going. So I don't want to make that same mistake again. A number of the, the, the lessons learned and recommendations from the, the, the Hudson Harkin report uh, are already being implemented, where we are examining the way forward in relation to them. I'm more concerned about getting computer-based assessment right at this stage rather than finalising uh, the procurement exercise or uh, making the statutory obligation upon schools. Once again, let's get it right and then let's move towards procurement and making it a statutory obligation if need be once again. Thank you. And I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Question four, please. The gross capital budget for the Department of Education for 14-15 is £183.4 million. The majority of this budget will be used to develop and improve the school estate through capital allocated to major works, minor works and school enhancement projects. This budget will also be used to fund youth services, transport, ICT early years as well as a number of other capital requirements. As for the 14-15 year, it is the last year of the current CSR period. The amount available for capital budget for subsequent years has not yet been decided. As I am committed to providing better facilities for our children and young people to learn, bids for capital funding will continue to be made through the budgetary process to ensure an improved working environment for teachers and other school staff. In this regard, to date, I have not announced plans to deliver new bills for Priory College, Hollywood Primary School or Hollywood Nursery School. A process is currently underway within my department to assess options for a potential further major capital announcement. This process will not conclude uh, until late spring, early summer 14. And call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his answer and his continued interest in the Hollywood Schools project? And does the Minister recognise that Hollywood Primary School is a growing school and Priory College is working hard to increase numbers, which is a very difficult task considering they exist in a crumbling building while competing with other modern schools in the wider North Down area? Uh, I thank the member for a supplementary question. Uh, I accept the need for new builds in the Hollywood area. My difficulty is matching the new builds not only in Hollywood but throughout the jurisdiction uh, against the limited capital budget I have. I have also resisted time and time again making announcements about capital bills are announcing lengthy lists of capital bills that I am not convinced can be delivered in a reasonable time. And even when we do that, it has to be said that you run into unexpected uh, delivery problems in relation to capital bills, uh, whether that be planning, whether it be site purchase, whether it be Japanese hogweed. All those things uh, can delay building programmes. But I am working on a new announcement uh, to move forward the building programme. If, uh, and I, I refer to all members, if a, if a member's school is not included in that list, I would say this to you. We are now involved in a rolling capital bills program. There is no, no longer one-off announcements and then escaping for a number of years. I am committed to a rolling program of capital bills over the next number of years, which will carry through this mandate and indeed into the next mandate uh, of the Assembly, because we do need to, a significant investment in our schools and state, and even with limited resources, we can make a difference. I call any supplementaries. Can I remind members that uh, this, again, this question is very constituency specific, and the supplementaries must relate to the original question. And I call Ms. Rosie McCarley. Can the minister give an overall assessment of his capital budget for new builds uh, over the coming years? I am going to intervene on this occasion. I just think that's absolutely uh, no relation to the original question. So I'll move on, and I call Mr. John Dallet. Question number five, which I hope is relevant. 
Uh, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I will answer question five and eight together. Um, the OECD report spoke extremely positively about the synergies between our evaluation and assessment policy, and specifically that the rationale behind the development and implementation of level of progression is, and I quote, to sound and congruent with European practice, unquote. And building an assessment process in which we can all have confidence that our partners continuing to reduce the pressure, real or perceived on schools, this allows us to restate the primary purpose of the new arrangements, which is to assist teaching and learning and, to, to, and, to, and not simply to provide data to the system for accountability purposes. As a result of feedback from teachers in the 12-13 year, for example, changes were made to the arrangements for 13-14, including slowing down the pace of change, reducing the workload for teachers and removing the March return date for pupil portfolios. Further work will be taken forward and discussions will continue as the arrangements evolve. This engagement will be fully inclusive of schools, teachers and their representatives. Call Mr. Dallet for supplementary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, I uh, marvel at the Minister's uh, optimism. The, these key stage assessments are going down like a lead balloon. Can he tell the House what is wrong with the current key stage assessments which inform uh, teaching uh, for the future. What is wrong with them? Our key stage assessments are the new ones that are being introduced and were returned by 75% of our schools in the last year, has to be said. So the vast majority of schools, while they may disagree with elements of them, have returned the key stage assessments. Our, the purpose of reintroducing new ones was to align them to our curriculum and to ensure that we were measuring uh, the correct matters within our curriculum and actually measuring results against our curriculum. That previous curriculum. So that's the need for change. I have and my department have been involved in detailed negotiations uh, with representatives of, of teachers' organisations and we have continued to make progress. Um, and I have shown a willingness uh, to, to teachers to take on board their concerns. But as in with any negotiation and any discussions on the way forward, you can't have it all your own way. I call Mr Declan Michael Lear. Good. I'll ask Karen Corlea. Uh, could the Minister tell us what discussions has he had with the teaching unions in this matter? Um, my department, together with SEA, conducted a review of the end of key stage assessments arrangements last year, as we committed to do. This consisted of 10 face to face workshops with school leaders. That review was completed in 2013, and they considered this feedback and agreed the recommended changes. I asked officials to engage with teachers' unions on this issue, and that process is ongoing. Following that engagement, I wrote to schools clarifying the way forward for the 13, 14 year and beyond. My department is reducing the pressure, real or perceived, as I've said, on schools in regards to this matter. And part of my reason for bringing in the internationally respected OECD was to have an international look at our assessment arrangements. And the OECD have said our assessment procedures are fit for purpose. Where we fell down was, was, was with the initial engagement uh, with teachers' unions and teachers' representatives. I have now corrected that. There is a meaningful full engagement with the teachers and the teachers' unions on the way forward. I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister appears to be in denial on this, but given the concern uh, over the current key stage assessments and the fact that the committee was less than lukewarm, Will the Minister urgently pilot a new key stage assessment system to replace the discredited one? Well, if I was in denial in regards to this matter, I would have not made any changes to the assessment procedures whatsoever. I would not have reviewed the assessment procedures after one year, and I would have made no changes to the assessment procedures. The fact that I'm not in denial means that I've done all those things, and I have engaged constructively, and we have made changes, and we are making progress. Uh, in relation to this matter. But which assessment procedure would the member like me to pilot? Because there are several different opinions out there as to what assessment should look like, whether there should be assessment or not, whether assessment should be a single statutory test at the end of each year, and you, and you work to those results and you move forward. So there's no, there's no actual agreement or universal agreement uh, either on this island or indeed beyond, because the OECD reflected on this as well. There is no universal agreement on the way forward for assessment at the end of key stages. But the OECD did say our assessment procedure was fit for purpose. 
Thank you. And I call Mr. Robin Newton. Uh, question number six, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your information, I will answer questions six and ten together. Schools record pupil attendance electronically on their C2K system. My Department Circular 2013-13, Attendance, Guidance and Options Recording by School, issued to schools in June 2013. This provides guidance and strategies to manage pupil attendance. It also provides the codes which should be used for each category of options. The term truancy, while familiar, is not used. However, five types of absences are categorized as unauthorized options. No reason provided for absence. Family holiday, not agreed with school. Other absences where a reason provided is not acceptable, for example, shopping or birthday. No reason yet provided for absence, which is a temporary code, late after registration closed. The unauthorized option rates in each board for the 2012-13 school year were for the Belfast Board, 2.5%, Western Board, 2%, North Eastern, 1.7%, South Eastern, 1.8%, and the Southern Education Library Board, 1.8%. Responsibility for ensuring that pupils attend schools rests with parents and guardians. Last year, my department issued school attendance matters, a parent's guide to the parents and guardians of all year one and year eight pupils. This year, the leaflet will be given to the parents and guardians of all pupils. My department has programmes to support vulnerable groups such as school-age mothers, newcomers and travellers. I have also asked my officials to develop a policy on looked after children. My department also funds the Education and Welfare Service. If a pupil's absence is causing concern or if they attend less than 85 per cent, the school should refer to the EWS for support if appropriate. And I call Mr Newton for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And, uh, I ask my, my uh, question really because I was concerned about reports that um, uh, the numbers of children who were being taken away from school to attend holidays outside of the, the normal. Could the Minister explain, is there an initiative within the schools or within the board areas to actually address that uh, particular problem? Well, as I said, uh, we have issued leaflets to all year one and year eight pupils, and this year we'll be issuing them to all pupils and parents in regards to the need for children to be in school and uh, unacceptable reasons for absence. And a, a child can go on leave or on holiday with the parents if it is agreed with the school, but certainly parents shouldn't take children out and not agree those matters with the school. Uh, uh, moving forward uh, in that regard. So well, there is an initiatives in place. Schools also have a responsibility as part of their development programme and, and, their, and their plan moving forward on how they, they tackle and support attendance in school, as do boards through their work uh, with the, the welfare officers as well. I call Mr. Alec Maskey. Could I uh, first of all thank the Minister for his responses so far? And could I ask the Minister, does he see what many would see as an important role for the wider uh, community in terms of tackling issues like absenteeism in schools? Um, well, yes, of course, and uh, as in with any area of education, I think it's vitally important that uh, parents, family and the broader community are involved and are shown to be supportive of education and of the benefits of education. Uh, and indeed, um, where problems persist, schools should be dealing with parents, should be talking to parents, engaging with parents, trying to establish why children are being absent from school. Uh, is, there, is there underlying reasons? Is there bullying? Is there problems at home? Uh, what, what is the issue that's keeping that child away from school? All those things should be interrogated. I have also recently uh, announced and launched uh, funding for community initiatives for further engagements between schools and, and the community, re-emphasizing the importance of education. And that message can only be effective if a child is in school being educated. That's the most important action uh, that any parent can take to ensure their child is in school and then work with the school to support the child through their education. Thank you. And order that ends the, uh, the period for oral questions. We now move on to topical questions and I call Ms Michaela Boyle. Can I ask the Minister how his recent announcement on the Schools Enhancement uh, Programme will benefit local schools and the wider economy? Uh, thank the Member for a question. Uh, during pr the question time, 
I was asked about my capital budget and how we would use that most effectively moving forward. And in recent years, we have introduced the School Enhancement Programme, which will allow us to invest between £500,000 and £4 million into a school to improve their facilities. It also allows us to stabilise some of the school estate we have out there and ensure that schools can be maintained uh, properly and ensure that teachers uh, and pupils are working and being taught in proper facilities. I'll just give the member a number of examples of um, what, what the work is, what will be carried out. Uh, I'll uh, be parochial and go to my own area. Uh, special school, Sierra Special School in Lurgan, for instance, a well-known school will receive five new classrooms as a result of this matter. Millington Primary School uh, will receive uh, new classrooms and a new parking facilities, etc. etc. Friends School Lisbon uh, will be provided with a new music and maths block with refurbished history department and removal of a maintenance workshop. Value of around three million pounds for that one, one and a half million pounds or so for the Sierra project. So significant investment, but also a significant investment in our economy as well. A significant investment in the construction industry and in jobs. I call on Ms Boyle for a supplementary. Um, can I thank the Minister for his response and indeed he, he uh, answered my supplementary uh, in terms of the significant investment. Thank you. And I'll call Mr Cahill O'Hoshin. Given the urgent need for the reconfiguration of education and library boards in order to converge with RPA, does the Minister feel that the creation of the Education and Skills Authority is any longer a realistic prospect? Um, whether it be a realistic prospect or not, the Executive is going to have to make a decision about where this journey is going to take us. I am now faced with following uh, the lengthy debates in the Assembly last week on the approval of the Local Government Reform Bill moving forward with the reshaping of our local councils, a reduction from 26 to 11. Our education and library boards are no longer uh, configured to meet the, those board areas. So therefore, unless there is significant uh, decisions made and significant change made, uh, our education and library boards will be acting ultra-virus come uh, May 2015. So decisions have to be made. Uh, people have resisted ESA for a variety of, of party political reasons and I suspect uh, personal reasons, but they need to set all those things aside uh, and come to a conclusion in regards to what we're going to do with our education and library boards. Mr. Hussein for a supplementary. Uh, the people asking, does the Minister feel that the current ESA bill would have been supported by the education sectors and the stakeholders? I go on by isolation, called us in Christ. Um, I can only go on by the, the comments of the vast majority of the education sectors that they are supportive of moving forward with the ESA bill. Uh, I have acted, uh, in my opinion, and politicians will always be challenged in these matters, uh, on a, in a responsible way. I have made significant concessions uh, to a number of sectors to ensure that the Education Skills Authority could move forward. Uh, however, every time I made a concession, another demand was placed on the table, and that leads me to suspect that there were either political parties or individuals who were deliberately blocking progress in regards to the ESA bill, despite it being a programme for government commitment. I call Mr. Trevor Lund. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister if he's familiar with the, the survey that was launched here yesterday, the Business of Education, which is a survey of Northern Ireland business leaders? And does he have any comments on the findings in the survey? The only uh, familiarity I have with uh, the report is what I've read in this morning's media. Uh, and I suspect that the member is referring to the parent support for integrated education coming from uh, the business sector, which in itself has to be welcome. But I, I would put the challenge up to those sponsoring the report, and they may well already do this. Uh, and those sponsoring the report, the best way to support integrated education is to send your child to an integrated school. Mr. Lund, for a supplementary. Yeah, well, luckily I have a copy of the report, which I'm happy to pass to the Minister in a moment. Uh, but the, the, the thrust of the findings is very much in favour of the, what they call a desegregation of our education system. And it, it's heavily in favour of that as a means of strengthening cross community relationships in the workplace and uh, positive impact on economic growth. If, if you couple that, Minister, with the other surveys which are regularly produced in favour of integrated education, 
Is, is the minister satisfied? Once again, I ask him that his department is doing enough to to, to encourage and facilitate integrated education as required by statute. Well, uh, I don't think, and as I say, I haven't read the report, but I don't think anybody would argue against the desegregation of education and the breaking down of barriers in our society. And indeed, the shared education report um, gave us opportunities uh, to move that debate forward and has kept the debate flowing uh, over a period of time. I, I am, well, let me answer the question in this way. I'm always looking for new opportunities to ensure that we're living up to our statutory obligations in relation to integrated education and ensuring that we are promoting and facilitating it. I can use examples recently where I have approved significant enrolment in Enniskillen, integrated primary school, uh, and a number of other areas. Unfortunately, uh, integrated education in Portadown, the primary school came forward with a proposal. The only reason I rejected that one was because the site which I have approved a new build for was not big enough for the size of school they were envisaging going into the future which would have meant that I would have had to delay capital investment in that area, I would have delayed building a new integrated school, and my suggestion back was that they go away and look for a site for a second integrated school in the Portadown area. I think that's the best way forward for that area. So it's not a case of denying integrated education there, it's promoting a second school and then going to build a brand new school uh, for the first school that's there. So there is significant investment and movement moving ahead, but as I say, I think there's a responsibility in all ministers to look for new ways of delivering their services. Thank you, Ms. Karen McEvitt. Thanks, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, in acknowledging the contribution uh, area uh, learning partnerships are making to shared education and providing educational opportunities for young people, especially those uh, who are challenged by the normal uh, school environment, uh, how has this been addressed by your department? Well, uh, firstly, in terms of area learning communities, I'm very supportive of area learning communities. Uh, and the partnership and indeed the sharing that goes on uh, among schools in areas. And I most recently had a report from my permanent secretary and his team who have visited all the area learning communities and were, brought me back a report which was supportive in areas, critical in other areas, and presented challenges to the Department of Education in other areas which we will analyse uh, and, and move forward on. In relation to how I support children who do find the school environment difficult. We have EOTIS, education other than at school, uh, which we support and ensure that there is facilities there for children who, can't, who cannot attend school for whatever reason, for, for whatever valid reason, have an educational venue to go to. But I think every endeavour must be made to ensure that a child is in their host home school. That's the best way forward for children, but I accept there's always an exception to the rule. Ms. McEvitt for a supplement. Thanks, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, given that schools are currently planning their curriculum now for September, what assurances can the Minister give that funding this extremely valuable project will be in place? And have you brought this to the Executive uh, to ensure that funding is targeted so that all schools and colleges delivering this uh, programme can get on with doing just that? Well, in, in relation to the element the Member refers to there, the implementation of the entitlement framework. Uh, which schools were funded for uh, over several years, up to the value, I think, of around £9 million per annum. Uh, that funding was due to come to an end, uh, if my memory serves me right, in the 13-14 financial year or the 14-15 financial year, perhaps. I agreed, despite very restricted budget I have myself, of continuing that funding on a, on a lesser basis of £4.5 million moving forward. I will examine my budget moving forward to see if we can support that into the next number of years or to see what best way to support schools uh, going, into, going into the future years. And I will be engaging, as will all ministers, with my executive colleagues around the education budget uh, moving forward for 15-16, and I will be putting forward a very strident argument that education needs increased investment. Thank you. And question five was withdrawn in the appropriate time frame, so I call Mr Pat Sheehan. I've got a free loss, Concorla. And, uh, could I ask the Minister to outline the reasons uh, for the increase in the value of the Irish medium factor in the common funding formula? Um, consultation responses uh, were the reason why I decided to make my decision to increase and significantly increase uh, funding to post-primary Irish medium education. There has been ongoing discussions and, and reports, uh, particularly from our only standalone post-primary school, the College of First Year. 
around the significant pressures they face delivering the entitlement framework uh, through the medium of Irish, because they have no partnership schools in that sense to work with through the medium of Irish. Uh, there was uh, responses from the variety of, of different sources, some for an increase and some opposed to an increase, but on balance I decided that a significant increase was merited uh, to ensure that we live up to our statutory obligations in relation to Irish medium education. Mr. Sheehan for supplementary. Uh, uh, and I know myself from having spoken to the governors in College first that they do face difficulties, but I wonder could the Minister confirm that the consultation process clearly showed up specific needs within the Irish uh, medium post primary that require additional support? Not only did the consultation report show it up, but also, and we go back to Sir Bob Bezilsbury's initial report upon which I based my initial consultation on the common funding formula. I think he and his team suggested that it should increase to £289 or somewhere in around that, that factor. Again, through the consultation, uh, College of First, you put up a very strong case in regards to this matter. Other schools with Irish medium units attached uh, raised this matter. A number of the education boards responded both in favour and opposed to uh, increasing. So on the basis of the evidence before me, I decided to increase the funding to Irish medium. Thank you. And I call Mr. Michael Majimpsey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister that, given the controversy around the decision to amalgamate uh, Knock Breda and Newton Breda High Schools, a decision brought forward by the South Eastern Education and Library Board, a board run by three commissioners with no democratic input, does he consider that that board is fit for purpose? Um, the simple fact of the matter is that. The South Eastern Education and Library Board would not be in existence if we had ESA, and there would be democratic accountability on ESA. All the sectors would have been represented on the board, and everyone would have had their voice heard during the decision-making process. The members' party and well, individuals in, in the party opposite me have blocked ESA at every move. So you end up with retaining the South Eastern Education and Library Board run by commissioners, because what is I, as Minister, I had a programme for government target of establishing ESA in 2013. Why would I have stood down the commissioners and put in uh, a, a fully functioning board? It wouldn't have made sense. Now, as Minister, I am faced with reconfiguration of 26 councils into 11. I have to reconfigure the boards or board into, to, into that shape. So why would I stand down the commissioners ahead of that? So if you are wondering why there are no elected representatives making these decisions, perhaps you should look yourself in the mirror and go, it's decisions I have made that have stopped that. Mr. Majimsi for a supplement. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, a, a very convoluted answer which appears to suggest that the Minister does not think they are fit for purpose, but is quite happy to use the situation in an effort to bring about a body which there is no prospect of coming forward at the minute. ESA has no prospect at the moment, and surely it is incumbent on the Minister that he gets rid of a body and democratises a body that currently evinces all the worst aspects of direct rule. Well, for the record, and to, to ensure that there's no doubt in your mind, I believe that the South Eastern Education and Library Board is fit for purpose. However, I also believe that the democratic way forward is to have an education body with elected representatives upon it. I, I'm a Democrat. I believe in that. I was outlining to you, and it is convoluted because it's been a very convoluted journey, I can assure you, as someone who has travelled the journey of ESA. If members support a programme for government commitment to establish ESA in 2013, I am legally bound as Minister to work towards that. ESA has been blocked. ESA has been stopped. Therefore, I am now looking at a situation where councils are reconfigured. Why would I stand down the commissioners on the South Eastern Education and Library Board ahead of a decision of what the boards or board will look like uh, in, in the year ahead? It would not make sense. It would not be the best use of public time or resources. And indeed, I suspect. It would take me several months to reconstitute the South Eastern Education and Library Board. And by the time I have achieved that, then I will be into, well, how long? We're now having to change the boards or board to match the, 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 the new council boundary. So let's, let's do this in a sensible way and move on. Order and time is up. And that concludes question time.